should have actually looked over my shoulder, sorry. So yeah, it's based on uh, a couple of projects. One is my doctoral research um, over the course of a light, nice short nine years uh, with James Barrett in Cambridge. And uh, it's also combined with my new project on a prosopography of the north of Ireland. So seeing as there were so many people today talking about Scotland, I decided to stay on uh, the Irish side of the North Channel, just in case there were a lot more people in the room that know more than I do. And as it turns out, there are. Okay. So look, um, I'm keeping people from their coffee, so I'll just fly through some of this stuff. Um, what I would say is the textual narrative that we have is extremely problematic. Very. Um, things like the Dal Rieta, the Dal Fietok, um, which we associate with, uh, with, with power, the Dal Narda, on either side of the North Channel, are all at the very earliest 7th century inventions. So, and even the Dal Fietok, they usually get left off that list. But the reality is you've got more something a bit more like the Canal Devon, uh, the Canal Nauron, uh, the Canal Cogel, Canal Nectach, the Critna Elnia, the Echelbad Elnia, or Echelbad, the Critna Echelbad, sorry about that, and the Echa Kobo. Um, and they all emerged as the dominant groups around this time, probably 5th, 6th century. But what I'm going to try and argue today is that there might have been other groups who were obscured by this rise, because when you get yourself into a position of power, you pay a genealogist, to justify you being there and go, well, look, this fellow's the great great grandson of Adam, of course it's his, or sometimes hers. So, um, before I go on, since I'm talking about kingdoms, I'll do this very briefly. What I would say is to be a kingdom, you have to have a king. Okay, first <laughs> off. Now, that might sometimes be a regularly, regularly rather than a rex, because this is one of the problems with the Irish re. It's not uh, directly semantically equivalent to king, it's more. Uh, different grades of sort of kingship and things like that. And I've got another paper that argues all of this. It's complex, but not that complex. But just know that between any languages, anyone who speaks two languages knows there are very few 100% uh, correlations. So what I would argue, you would have to have a concentration of people to have a kingdom. And you have to have a, comp uh, you have to have a concentration of resources, uh, ideological, economic, political, and military resources. Uh, that's from Man 1986, uh, Tilly. 92 and Norbert Elias back in 1939. Did that go on? No. Well, I think you probably used up all my batteries. <laughs> yeah, it's working now, of course. As soon as I said something, it flew on four slides. So look, um, the textual narrative, as I already said, is very, very complicated. Um, for those of you familiar with Irish uh, texts, uh, basically, just like we're trying to do today, there were scholars in the 10th century that said, all of this is really messy. Let's make it a bit more rational, a bit more normal. Um, if only I had fallen, I would have gotten out of it. Um, a bit more rational, yeah, a bit more normalised. So what they did was try and force everything into what was what they decided was the received wisdom. Now, that could be for political reasons, but sometimes just for scholarly reasons. And uh, what I would argue is that there are some texts that were very, 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 very influential in this respect. So the Vita Tripartita, which unlike Paddy, I would see is about 930, dating to the reign of, uh, or the abbacy of Yosef of uh, Armagh, who was a member of the, the Canal Lorne from, uh, from Western Scotland. Um, and I think that all they'd suffer with the Dalriot in there is there to impress him. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff in there, and a lot of it got overwritten, a lot of it got written into uh, sets of annals that were being transcribed. So you got a lot of late stuff inserted in and pretending to be early stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and look at some of the other stuff that's in there to see how we get on. So just before I, I go on, um, here's some settlements. So basically, I just run around the map. So up here you have the Critnelia, possibly the Don Rieta here later on, but I don't think very early. Um, you have the Equator right here in this great big patch. Uh, no surprise that they're pretty much the second most powerful dynasty all the way through. Uh, you have the Dal Fiatok here, the uh, Yaka Garja here, possibly another branch of the Dal Fiatok here, the uh, Borkia here, you've got the Yaka Kobo here, and um, yeah, that'll do, that's too much information as it is. But you can see there are clusters of settlements, yeah? So each one of these is based on something with clusters of settlements. So I've kind of put, superimposed the more high status settlements, and you'll see that there is some kind of correlation either with the center of one of these areas or with its edges, because you think about a warrior aristocracy. So then over here, I've got the um, more Iron Age and 300 to 600, 300 to 700 stuff. And again, you get 
clusters here, but you've also got some stuff that's hard to explain down here. And of course, there's the Critonalia, who were, I would imagine, a returning federati from the Roman Empire. And I think that that's what's lying behind a lot of the stuff that's going on just at the dawn of textual recording in, in Ireland. So just keep those in mind if you can. Uh, here's some stuff about settlement. Um, here's a cumulative curve of all the different forms of enclosed settlement from, uh, from the Kingdom of Ullid. Uh, that's according a value of 1 to anything that would fall within a certain range. And here's the diagrams on which they were based. But what I would like you to pay attention to is this crano here, because you will need that in a minute. And also the Iron Age dates from Neolithic enclosures that were reoccupied in the Iron Age. Um, there's done several, unfortunately, when he got two little dots. What can you do? Um, but yeah, you can see a lot of the stuff is later, but occasionally there's some stuff that pushes earlier. So, a bit problematic. How long have I got? Oh yeah, Grant. It's always better to just check these things, you know. Sometimes someone turns around and is already waving the stop sign at you. So the first group I want to talk about are the Korka Oche. Anyone ever heard of them? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah, well. So the Korka Oche are, uh, later on, they're, uh, they're bashed into the uh, Ejerka coin, who are a very, very problematic group, but were probably very important. Um, but later on, the Huedelbad, when they got people to rewrite their genealogies, had them descended from their progenitor's second family. So he had one family with a very high status queen, then a second family with a lower status queen, and they're from the second family. And the Dalnarja are all descended back from the first family, the Laharna, the Echakobo. So this is how was, all these various peoples were put together. They were probably never related, but it's a great way to stop killing each other, going, ah, cuz, stop. But um, yeah. Another thing that happens to the, uh, the Kirkwoke, so first of all, they're subverted into this, um, into this genealogy by at least, probably quite late, actually. I'm not quite sure that these genealogies are all that early, but by the 11th century, anyways, they're being treated as a very, very minor branch of one of the more dominant dynasties. But you also get um, the law of 10 um, synchronisms and genealogies um, trace back to Duftok de Alchanga, who was a bit of a mixture of Loki and uh, the Ajax who came home and killed all his family in, in Greek mythology. Um, I can never remember whether that's Telamonian Ajax or the other one. So. Um, and he did all of that. So yeah, you've got this classical influence that's always at play with all this myth mythology because it's all quite late. But basically, he's the biggest asshole in the Rurecht, which is the main uh, saga cycle in Ireland. He is, well, Bricu is, he's still at least got some redeeming features, but this guy is just a horrible human being. So to have him as your progenitor when there's a lot more up for grabs, seeing as it's all imaginary, that's already saying something. But the same family are blamed for um, the big lake. If you were familiar with Ireland, there's a big massive lake up in the north. And that's Loch Nea or Loch Nectoc in, uh, in Irish. And uh, they're blamed for leaving a well uncapped out of their stupidity and flooding and killing thousands of people who were living on the plain that got flooded by the lake. So again, that's not quite a nice thing to be saying about these people. Um, but uh, another thing is, remember I said there about the, the second family, um, so this second family, a brother and a sister got drunk and uh, had some incestuous sex and a baby came along and um, where it happened was at Rath Mesk, so they, either the drunken gift, if it depends on how you see Rath or Rath as either gift or enclosure, but it's probably enclosure, drunken enclosure, enclosure of drunkenness in the middle of a plain called Mahra Mesk, so the plain of the drunkenness and um, this is where they get the name then, because Oche is the sister, according to this um, mythological genealogy. And the product of that was a guy called Fergus Foga. Now, this guy is the big loser in Northern Irish mythological politics because he basically lost what is probably complete nonsense anyways, that Olives went any further west than the ban. Um, but he's supposed to have been the one who lost Aon Vaca and Navan Fort. He's supposed to be the one that lost the overkingship of the north of Ireland to the three colours and various other uh, members of the Canuchta. So again, not exactly painting someone in, um, in a good light. Now, why would you do that? Why would you have your genealogist do that? Because your position might still be insecure. But also, are we looking at one powerful group from the late Iron Age, um, early medieval period, that later more powerful groups try to write out of history by denigrating them as much as possible all through the sources. Now this is 
quite out there in the ether, I know, but let's uh, let's have a look at some of the settlement. So, Ratmesk is somewhere there. We haven't actually identified it yet, but it is somewhere in the vicinity of Trumery, which is in the middle of the parish of, uh, of, of Maharamesk, which we know from the 1306 taxation. Um, but near it, you've got this uh, pair of conjoined rats um, and a toponym called Lisnevilla, which would be the enclosure of the bilia, which is probably a yew tree. Often it can be just a very, very impressive tree, but it's sometimes already. Yeah. My God. So anyway, um, you do have that right there at the core. Um, one of the things is, one of the reasons I went through so much, so many pains to try and show you where the big densities of rats were, this is not there. So this predates it. But there's still some other stuff. You've got some good ecclesiastic sites in the vicinity. Well, then you get down to Dromore, which is more the core of the Echa Kobo. Up here is, well, actually all the way up there, but that's the start of it. It's where the Echredelbad were, were powerful. But of course, they do have this association with Loch Ness. So have to be pushed down here and then the story written. And um, Maybe did they have the whole of this or is there something else going on? I mean, this is the Lagan Valley and you've got some Roman stuff over about here as well. Um, it's, I, I don't know, I think it's something that we, we should think about, but I'll move on to a very quick second study. So the Bonriga. So if those of you familiar with the patrician hagiographies, the two early ones, Tirup and Amiraku, both uh, mentioned that um, that Patrick was the property of a guy called Milhu, and um, that he had various visions and, and things like that, either on Skerry or on Sleeve Mish, both of which are adjacent to one another. Um, but then there's some other stuff that's saying that Milku had a palace that you could see from Sleeve Mish. So, again, the Bone Riga pop up maybe as the uh, Maku Bone further south or the Dal Boon, but I think, or the Dal Bunya, but they might be two different groups. But we'll have a look and see what we can find. Now, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about these is the biggest find of, uh, of Latin objects in Ireland in one group comes from a lake up here. Okay? Listen to Crawler. That's where that is. So, We'd say there's Skerry where he's supposed to have the vision. Sleeve Mish is, is here on the mountain. You've got a trivalet rat there, which might be early. You've got a remember that Titian Cranog that I was showing you? Uh, well, there you go. Um, you've also got Craigie Warren, which has got early evidence. Uh, you've got Cully Backy, which is a problematic um, site, but it's mentioned in some of the patrician stuff, some of the later stuff. But it's also got in, in Maxtown Townland adjacent, it's got a shared of Ewer, so you have to start wondering. But I mean, you've got, as you can see there, um, you've got hill forts, you've got everything around there. But you've also got the modern town of Ballymena here, where the two rivers meet, which I left out of the map. But again, are we looking at a core territory? Now, for my, for my dissertation, when I mapped the, uh, the Tuha, which were already mentioned, um, all the two, three, three of the Tuha join here, in this area. So I'm thinking that the Tuha might post-date that these kinds of peoples are buried by the Tuha system where everything was redrawn maybe fifth, six, seven centuries. Because, um, I mean, I, I don't know, I think so many high status sites all in one place in a fairly good bit of farmland. There's a reason why Ballymena town is there today. Um, you know, and you do have um, some uh, plain place names, which is usually uh, designating the core of a territory. There was another one I was going to talk about that was in Mirku. Very, very, very um, tentative, but Basically, the Grecaga, um, where the people from which the patron saint of the Isle of Man came, and where he's supposed to have come from, he was supposed to be up in the Eachach, up on a hill, being a pirate, which is usually how these things describe somebody who is a former king who is now not a king. So, are the Grecaga the original group in, in southern, uh, Cob or southern Quip before the Eachach Cobo came along? And I mean, just before I run, run away, um, so there's Drummore Brig, which has associations with the very, very, very earliest stuff that we know about the Ullid that does not appear in the annals. So Carol is probably associated with here. We have no idea how old, the, how long the Eacha Kobo were called as such, or if they were Ullid or Critton originally. Um, but look, you've got, you've got Lisnigade here. You've got this complex of rats all around here. Um, you've also got, yeah, as I said, Drummore Brig. You've got... Um, this site Tavlach here, which is associated with British saints and whatever. You've got Loch Brickland, which is supposed to be the capital of the Echa Kobo, but I can never find anything associated with it other than people from the Ullid. The guy who got killed there by Vikings was actually a member of the Ullid. So look, either these people are 
the original, original, original Ullid, or a branch of the Ullid, or again, it's another kingdom that got sub subsumed in. And I mean, again, the two are boundary. This is right in the middle of it. You know, there's, it's hard to tell. Anyway, look, I leave it at that. There are some other groups that we could talk about the next time, but just to know that there are loads of them. Thanks. Thank you.